Uh, good morning, everybody. So what happens in a small church when a couple people go out of town and a couple people are sick? <laughs> it looks quite empty. That's all right. Trust that the people who are here this morning are the ones who are supposed to be here, right? If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Jude. If you don't know where Jude is, pretty much go straight to the back. If you find Revelation, go back one more. That's where Jude is. The next two Sundays, we're going to go through the book of Jude. Now, we just finished up our series on the Thessalonian epistles, those Thessalonian letters. And on the 29th of this month, 29th? What's today? 15th. 15th, yeah. On the 29th, we're having um, a representative from a new generation, Pregnancy Center, come and talk to us about Amendment 4. We want to be informed on that. And so that Sunday is going to be a little bit more topical, talking about uh, that subject of abortion and what God says about that. So we have two Sundays to fill here, and so it's a good opportunity to look at one of these smaller books, one of these smaller books that we normally don't hear a Sunday morning message on, the ones right towards the back, right? You don't normally hear a message on Second John, Third John, Jude. Uh, the book of Obadiah doesn't get talked about very much, these one chapter books. But it's a good book, nonetheless. That should be obvious, but I'll just state the obvious. It's important for us to know what is here. The 66 books that we have in the Bible are the ones that God wanted us to know and to understand, and they have the truth, complete truth of God, communicated to us. And so we want to know what it says. So. I'm calling this two-part series, Contending for the Faith. You'll see why here in just a minute as we get into this. And, you know, I've done a lot of study of Jude over the years. I've, I've found it really interesting, fascinating. I've never preached it before. And as I've prepared to preach it, it's a lot harder to say, all right, what is the message that God wants us to understand rather than just studying it for my own enjoyment? So this is a little bit hard to prepare for. And I think the reason why is this is an easy book to go down a rabbit hole. This is an easy book to go just wandering on a trail. It's easy to start thinking about all these things that the book isn't saying rather than what it is saying. We read some things in this book and we say, well, does that mean this? And does that mean this? And does that mean this? Well, it's not talking about that. Let's focus on what it is actually talking about. So let's go ahead and start this morning. We actually have a lot of ground to cover. We're only going to verse 10, but that is a lot of ground to cover when it comes to the book of Jude. So I'm just going to read the first three verses here. We're going to divide these up into little sections. I'm not going to read the whole passage like I normally do. Just read these first couple of verses as we get going. It says, Jude here, verse 1, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay, so this is another letter, like what we've been studying. Philippians was a letter. Thessalonians was a letter. This is also a letter. Who wrote the letter? It says right here, right? It says Jude. Jude is the author of this letter. And who was Jude? Well, it says he's the brother of James. And early church fathers and uh, others have said this is the same James who was the half-brother of Jesus. So if James is the half-brother of Jesus and Jude is his brother, what does that make Jude? Half-brother of Jesus, right? There's biblical reason for this as well, Matthew 13, 55. This is when Jesus was during his ministry and he was teaching and uh, they said, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mar called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Oh, Judas. Interesting. Well, we're talking about Jude, and it says Judas. Well, in Greek, that's the exact same word, Iotis. Um, why did the translators translate it sometimes Judas and sometimes Jude? There is no reason. I have no idea. That is an inexplicable way to confuse people. 
Uh, I can't explain it. It's the exact same word in Greek, Jude. Okay, so it says right here that his, he had a brother named Jude and James, and that is who wrote this letter here. Okay, so who's this to? It's from Jude. Uh, the interesting thing about J, uh, Jude and James is that they did not follow Jesus during his lifetime. They weren't followers of Christ during his lifetime. But immediately afterwards in Acts 1, it says that they are with them there in the upper room. Jesus' brothers are with them there in the upper room. So right after the crucifixion resurrection, his brothers do seem to come to faith in Christ and then their church leaders very early on. All right, so who's this to? The recipients are to Christians. Verse 1 it says, To those who are called, those who are beloved in God, those who are kept for Jesus Christ, these are things that you would say very indicative of someone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, someone who is a born-again believer. It's not specifically to any believers in a particular place, right? Paul wrote that letter to the Thessalonians. He said to those who are in Thessalonica, to those who are in Philippi, when he wrote the book of Philippians. This one, it doesn't say to where, just to believers. Uh, so it's not talking about a specific situation. We can say that this is a little bit more uh, timeless, if you will, in its application, because this is believers anywhere, anytime. It, all of the Bible is that way as well. But sometimes you're going through something in a church where there's not maybe a direct application. This one would be a little bit more direct right now. You'll see as we get in here. All right, and so what's the reason for him writing? So Jude is the author. He's writing to believers. What is the reason he is writing? He says... I'm writing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints in verse 3. It's also interesting there in verse 3, what does it say? I was going to write about something else. I was going to write about something else here. I wanted to talk to you about our common salvation. It's almost as if he sat down to write this, and before he knew it, something else was coming out. <laughs> I sat down to write about our common salvation, but next thing I knew, here I am writing to you to contend for the faith. Now, this is something that we actually teach about the Bible. This is not a man-made book. This is a God-made book. He was working through human authors. He was inspiring human authors. He was speaking through them. They are writing it down with the pen, but it's really its source is in God himself. Uh, this is taught very explicitly in Scripture, 2 Peter 1.21, Right? No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is carrying these human authors along. That is what is getting the truth out there. And when you think about it, right, truth has to come from a place outside of man. We don't know everything. We are not all knowing. We are not all seeing. We are not the source of truth. God is the source of truth. So if his word is true, it has to be coming from him. So he's carrying along these human authors. And so here with Jude, uh, it's interesting, 1 Peter as well, it almost implies that uh, sometimes the authors would write things and they wouldn't even really understand what they were writing. It's, they're writing it and uh, this is what I feel inspired to write. It's coming from God. I really don't know what I'm writing about. Uh, it says that they're writing prophecies, things that they wish that they could look into. Uh, so with Jude here, he's sitting down, he's going to write something, and all of a sudden now I'm writing something else. I'm talking about something else entirely. I'm not writing about the common salvation anymore. I'm writing to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And when it says faith delivered for the saints, some would teach that God gives you faith to believe. Like you can't even believe the gospel. Uh, God has to give you that faith. And they would use this verse to say, look, faith is delivered to you. Uh, that's not what it's saying here. The faith here, when it talks about the faith, it's talking about the gospel message. Um, it is common to talk about the faith as the gospel. And so here's my proof of that, Galatians 1.23. When Paul came to faith in Christ, um, he's going around, and it says here, they were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith. He once tried to destroy. What is he preaching here? Paul says we preach Christ crucified, right? That's his message. He's going around preaching the gospel. He's not talking about this abstract concept of faith here. He's not preaching this abstract concept of faith. He's preaching the gospel message. He's going around preaching the gospel truth. Christ was 
uh, crucified and that he was buried and that he rose again. We preach Christ crucified. Um, so this is the gospel message is what it's saying here. Uh, contend for the faith. Contend for this gospel message that was delivered once for all, right? And so we would say that the gospel message is not what you can do for Jesus. It's what Jesus has done for you. The gospel is not a list of instructions on how to get saved. The gospel is a newspaper saying, read all about it. The good news is that Jesus Christ has paid your sin debt, a debt that you could not pay on your own. He has paid it in full. He delivered it to you. He offers it to you as a gift. He says, I've done this for you. Here it is. Will you receive it? And it's once for all. Hebrews teaches this. In the Old Testament, we see that uh, every single time we screwed up, we had to bring a sacrificial uh, lamb. We had to bring some sort of sacrifice to cover that sin. And it was only good for covering that one sin up. And the next time you screw up, you've got to bring another one and another one and another one. And it goes on and on. It never ends. But in Hebrews, it teaches that Christ was a more perfect sacrifice. He entered, he gave his blood, his body as a sacrifice, and it was once for all. And that's why he, when he's on the cross, he says, to Telestai, it is finished. Christ paid it in full there in that historic act on the cross 2,000 years ago. So it was delivered once for all, this gospel message. Uh, no need to go back and redo it was perfect the first time when he did it. And it's delivered to the saints, offered to us as a free gift. This is what we're contending for. This is the charge here and what he sees as the need of writing this letter. So if we could just summarize here this introduction to this short book. The author's Jude. He's writing to believers, and he's asking believers to contend for the gospel message, contend for the faith. So let's move in to a little bit more of the meat here. Why would this be a necessary thing for believers to know? Why would this be something of importance to us right here today in 2024? Let's read verses 4 through 7. It says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Okay, interesting. Verse 4, why must we contend for the gospel? Uh, because there's a dangerous stealth operation already in motion. Yeah, Jude points out that there are these people who have crept in. And the, and the language that he's using here, it's all one word here in Greek. Uh, <laughs> we take, well, four or five words to translate it in English. But uh, it's like this idea of something slipping up alongside of something else. Uh, if you've ever snuck up behind somebody just kind of standing there ominously. Uh, something has just kind of slid in here. The, the idea is that there's a, a stealthiness to it, a slickness to it, a creepy in, a sneaky, it, something that you're not going to notice unless you're looking for it. It's something that you're going to overlook because it's so uh, stealthy. And so these false teachers are the ones who have moved in here. And it's interesting, there's a lot of, if you've ever read 2 Peter chapter 2, there's 25 verses here in Jude. 15 of these verses are almost identical to verses in 2 Peter chapter 2. Okay, these two passages are really, really similar to each other. 
uh, part of the struggle in preparing to teach on Jude is God obviously communicated it in two places, so there's, there's probably something distinguishing the two, right? And it's hard to actually find something that distinguishes the two. They're so close. But one of the interesting distinctions you can make is that in Peter, Peter is saying, this is going to happen. This will happen. And he's talking about it as if it's a future thing. And then here in Jude, he talks about it as a present thing. This is already happening. And he actually quotes Peter. And he says, you remember that the apostles... Uh, in verse 17, he said, remember the predictions of the apostles. They said in the last time there will be scoffers. And then he's actually quoting 2 Peter chapter 2. And so when he says the apostles of the Lord, he's actually referencing Peter. So he's saying, remember that he predicted this would happen. Yeah, it's already happening. Okay, and that was 2,000 years ago when Jude wrote this, first century, first century church. Uh, it's definitely already a present thing in our time as well. And I would say that it's maybe even bigger issue today than it was in Jude's time. And here's why I say that. In the first century, a false teacher actually like had to be in your geographic proximity to have an influence in your life. To slip in, they had to be near you physically. We do not have that barrier anymore. Between the TV, between podcasts, between YouTube, all of these things, it is in your house right now, these false teachers. They are right here closer to us than they have ever been. Uh, so whereas, yes, it was present in the first century, a false teacher would actually have to be in your town, would probably have to be in your assembly to be able to slip in and exert influence over you. Nowadays, uh, it is right inside the house. Okay, so this is a big thing for us. Um, and it, he, level, he levies two charges here against these false teachers. Two charges here in verse 4. Okay, what about these, these people who are sneaking in, creeping in, slipping in? What do we say about them? It says that they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Some of your translations might say lasciviousness. If you've got a big word there. They pervert the grace of God, and they deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Some of your translators might only say Lord. There are two words there in the original, Master and Lord. Okay, so charge number one, they pervert the grace into sensuality, lasciviousness. This is a fancy way of saying loose living. So if you can think about two common problems in, in the church, one is this, and one is legalism. And legalism is like the other end of that spectrum. Legalism is saying, I'm going to alter my behavior under my own strength, and I'm doing it in so that I can gain what God gives me freely as a gift, right? And so that's what legalism is. When you're trying to earn what God gives you freely, right? So you're trying to earn your own righteousness, but God gives his, uh, the righteousness of his son to you freely by faith. We have the righteousness of Christ. So we're trying to earn what you've already been given through a set of rules, regulations, and self-altering behavior. That's legalism, and there's a whole book on that behavior as well in Galatians. And this one's talking about the other end of that spectrum, loose living, lasci lasciviousness, sensuality. It's when you say on the other end of the extreme, my behavior doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm free. I've been born again. I've been uh, totally... Uh, set free, and so it doesn't matter what I do anymore. Absolutely doesn't matter. I can do whatever it is that I want. Charge number one, that is not, that is not what um, God's Word teaches, right? That is a problem behavior. The other charge here is that they reject God's authority, right? So it says they denied their only Master and Lord. We're going to talk about more about this in a second. Um, but in, in essence, they're rebelling, right? This is rebellion, even though they would claim to be followers of Christ, they're actually rebelling against his authority in their lives. So I can do whatever I want, and God actually doesn't have any authority over me. And that's a problem. Now, you, would, you might say, well, we'll get into more of that in a second here. There's three stories that Jude tells. We have to keep it moving here. There's three stories that Jude tells here to illustrate this point. Okay, so he's given the accusation, the charge, uh, read them, hit, what, what, what is the charges against these preachers? Uh, the charge number one, yeah, they are 
advocating loose living. Number two, they reject God's authority. And so he's going to, and it's, you could summarize each of these things, both of them together, maybe you could say rebellion, right? If there's one thing that is a common theme here, it's rebellion. I'm a claiming to be a follower of Christ, but I'm rebelling against him. And that's a problem. He's going to give three stories here that illustrate his point here about rebellion. To his audience, I, I think he's clearly writing to a Jewish audience, um, a very strong Jewish audience, because he's going to reference a lot of things and kind of take for granted that they know what these stories are. Uh, we can't take that as much for granted, so we're going to talk about them here a little bit. Uh, so verse 5, story number 1. All these stories are making the same point here. Uh, verse number 5, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So I'm going to read this. Uh, you can turn there with me if you'd like. Exodus 14 is where I'm going to go. If you can recall, uh, the people of Israel were slaves in the land of Egypt, right, for 400 years. And after this time that they were slaves in Egypt, God brought them out of Egypt. If you've heard of the uh, 10 plagues of Egypt, I think we've all heard about that. Believers, unbelievers know this story of God sending these plagues, uh, humbling par Pharaoh, actually bringing him to this point where he's now going to let the people go. And he brings them out of the land of Egypt, and they're going to this promised land, this land that God promised them, Canaan. And they get there, and God says, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to drive out all these people, all these enemies in this land. They are just going, they're not going to be able to stand against you. It's not going to be your strength. It's going to be mine. I'm going to deliver this to you. And they doubted. They got scared. And Exodus 14, verse 20. Man, did I write down the right verses? All right. Nope, I did not write down the right verses, guys. I am sorry. It is not chapter 14, is it? Let's try 24. Nope, it's not 24. <laughs> wonder if it's the wrong uh, book that I wrote down. Maybe it's Numbers, but it's Numbers. Yeah, there we go. Numbers 14. How about that? Numbers 14, 20. All right. Sorry about that. Numbers 14, 20. It says, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Okay, so this is, they've already said, Oh, we're scared. And God says he's going to wipe out the, the nation of Israel. And Moses prays for them. And... Um, the Lord says, all right, I've pardoned them according to your word, talking to Moses, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will fully bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead body shall fall in the wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land which I swore, swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years, and shall suffer for the fa your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day. You shall bear your iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who have gathered together against me. And this wilderness shall 
uh, come to a full end and they shall die. And uh, yeah, this was because they did not believe God. They came out of Egypt. They watched him do these signs. They watched him uh, with the turning the Nile into blood, right? They saw the firstborn of all of Egypt's households die, and they saw they're spared because they actually put the blood on the door, right? They saw these signs and wonders in Egypt. They parted, it, God parted the Red Sea. They walked through it. They experienced God's power in a very real tangible way, and they doubted when they got to the land. He said, anyone who saw my, what I did in Egypt is not going to get to go into this land because they've now doubted. Uh, so he brought them out of Egypt, did not take them into the land because they did not um, submit to his authority. They rebelled. They rebelled. And only the children, 20 years and younger, were allowed to then go in. So this is a story here that Jude is referencing here. He's talking about these false teachers who have rejected God's authority in their life. And it's just like these people here in the wilderness. They all wandered for 40 years in the wilderness because they rebelled against God. Um, even though they had already experienced his power. I hope you haven't moved too much yet because we're going to go to Genesis 6 now. Okay? Genesis 6, since you're close. I'm going to read the next verse in Jude. Okay, so that was story number one, the wilderness. Stay with me. Here's story number two. You're turning to Genesis 6, and I'm reading verse 6 of Jude. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. He's referencing Genesis 6 here. And I'm not going to spend much time here because this is a bizarre story. All right, this is a really bizarre story. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and, the daughters, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Um... So what's interesting about Jude here is it talks about angels who left their position and are kept in chains. Now, if you know about fallen angels, most of them are not kept in chains. They are actually free to roam around and cause problems. Lucifer himself. What does Peter say? Be aware your adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a roaring lion. Right? So Lucifer himself is not in chains. Uh, many of the fallen angels are allowed to roam. Uh, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against the powers of the air. Right? So many fallen angels are still free, but there are some angels, apparently, fallen angels who are kept in chains, the ones who left their proper authority. It does seem like from this story here in Genesis 6 that this is uh, angels having relations with humans. I know that sounds bizarre. I honestly don't know another way to interpret this passage other than that. Uh, I've heard other interpretations. I think they fall short. And this is the understanding of the people in Jude's time, at the very least. Uh, the people in the first century, that's how they understood this passage. And so we see here that, and I believe this is a story that Jude is referencing. Angels, they have a proper position, a proper place. That's heaven right, with God, and they leave that and they pursue these unfit relationships, right? And so we see that they're leaving their position, going to a place that they should not be. What is that but rebellion, right? This is rebellion. They're rebelling against uh, what God has for them. They're rebelling against where they should be. They have left that proper place. So just like the people who come out of Egypt, Rebel against God once they get up to the land. These angels in heaven with God, rebelling against that, choosing to go a different course. And now if you're still in Genesis, I hope you are, turn to chapter 19. One more story here that Jude tells his audience. Jude 19, or excuse me, Genesis 19, and I'll read Jude 7 here. It says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, and pursued unnatural desire, 
serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so he's referencing this story here in Genesis 19. Read verse, I'll start in verse 4. Uh, this is, these angels have come into this town of Sodom, and there's a man named Lot who lives there. Lot welcomes these angels into his home. Now, these angels appear, uh, have a human, they look like humans. That's what I'm trying to say. They look like people, uh, but they are angels, and they've come into Lot's house now. Lot is being hospitable to them. But before they lay down, talking about the angels, before these angels even had a chance to lay down yet, they're in Lot's house, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. They don't want to know their names. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and he said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Uh, but they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. Okay, so the men in these passage, this passage, right? It says the men of the city, not the people of the city, the men of the city. And they're asking for the men in Lot's house to know them. And he says, I have two daughters who have never known a man. You can get to know them. Okay, we all know what it's talking about here. This is not knowing in the sense of let me get to know you. This is to sleep with them, right? Very clearly, this is a homosexual desire. And these men are so driven by this desire, this passion, this flame, that they are ready to break this door down. Here, I'll give you my daughters. No, we don't want your daughters. We're breaking down the door to get these men. Um, You've ever heard the term sodomy? That's where this comes from, right? Uh, Jude 7 says that this, just as in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, they indulged, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. Yeah, the natural desire is man and a woman. The unnatural desire, man with man. Uh, Romans 1 talks about this as well. I know that's not popular in our culture, but this is the truth. And what's interesting when you think about it is that natural desire is a gift from God. It is. There's nothing shameful about having a relationship, man and a woman, in the context of marriage as God designed. There's nothing shameful about that. That is what God gives. He gives that to us as a gift. That's a very good thing. Uh, unnatural desire, pursuing what you should not pursue, uh, that is not a good thing. That's rebellion yet again. Once again, they're rebelling against what is proper. They're leaving this proper place. So all three of these stories are telling the same thing, right? All three of these stories are illustrating this is just like a false teacher. Just like a false teacher. A false teacher is rejecting God's authority, rejecting any responsibility before God, rejecting their place, uh, beneath God's authority, they're rebelling against that authority. That is what a false teacher will do. Just like all of these people rebelled against God. Just like the people in the wilderness rebelled. Just like these angels rebelled. Just like these men of Sodom and Gomorrah rebelled. And all three of these stories are saying that, hey, yeah, rebellion, this happens. And what happens when there's a rebellion? Uh, there are consequences. God deals with it in each case. Right? So the people rebelled in the wilderness. Guess what? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. There was consequences. The angels left their position. Now they're kept in chains in gloomy darkness. There's consequences. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah left, rebelled, and pursued unnatural desire. 
And guess what? There was consequences. Fire, brimstone, those cities got destroyed. So there was consequences in each case. So God is aware. These people have crept in unnoticed. They don't go unnoticed with God. God is very aware, and he can see the heart. He knows what's going on, and there will be consequences. Uh, but for us, they're close by. These false teachers are close by. They're right near, and they are covert. They've slipped in. They've crept in. We are not going to notice it unless we are proactive in discerning their proximity to us. Yeah. Circling back to verse 4, it says, People deny our Master and Lord here in Jude. Deny our Master and Lord. This is the only place in the New Testament where this is used, Master and Lord. Many places that it talks about Lord, Kyrios, God is the Lord, right? He's sovereign. He's over all. Um, he is the Lord of all, whether or not we recognize it or not, right? By him we live and move. By him we hold together. He is Lord of all. Um, master is not something that's commonly used in the New Testament. It is used, uh, but not as much. And this is like a, uh, a, a, literally it's used in the passages where it talks about slaves obey your masters. Um, that is the, the context where it's used most often. But, you know, we're bond servants of Christ. Uh, that is a very healthy way to talk about it. And so he's our master. And this is the only place where it says master and Lord, right? So, like, if you recognize he's the Lord or not, he's still Lord. But as Christians, man, we, we actually, we, we recognize this. We call ourselves bond servants. Like, m over and abundantly, we should be submitting to God's authority in our lives as believers, Right? He is authority whether or not we recognize it or not. But man, as Christians, it's not just that he is the authority. Like we, we actually explicitly recognize it. To rebel against that, that is just unthinkable. That's crazy. And yet he's saying that th this is what happens with these teachers. They're claiming a relationship with God, but their lifestyles would actually indicate something completely different, and they're actually rejecting his authority. Now, we're going to read a few more verses here. We're going to close up, uh, I think, pretty much on time. And uh, what's, what's interesting here is I, I know a ton of people who would be like, well, I'm never going to listen to a teacher who would say you can just do whatever you want. I would never listen to a Bible teacher who would say, yeah, I don't, I don't recognize God's authority in my life, right? Nobody would ever listen to a Bible teacher like that. The problem is they're covert, it's not going to look like that explicitly on the surface. It's not going to be over and abundantly obvious unless you actually know what to look for, unless you're actually having those senses trained to look for it. That is the reality of what's happening. But remember, God sees the heart. He can see what's happening on the inside with these teachers. That is what they're doing on the inside. It's not necessarily always going to look like that on the outside. Like you're going to be like, dude, he just said that he... He could care less what God says. It's not going to be like that. There are going to be false teachers who are going to be claiming one thing, but on the inside, it's a completely different thing. So how do we learn to discern that? Uh, we're going to start getting into it here before we close up. Um, just so you know, like, it's, it's hard to talk about Jude, um, like breaking it into different messages. I mean, really, you're going to have to hear part two to get the full application for yourself next week, right? But we're going to try to make application as best we can here this week. We're still talking about these false teachers here, verses 8 through 10. It says, Yet in like manner, these people, what people? These, these false teachers. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses... He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. <laughs> uh, what? What did we just read? We're going to get into this in a second. Uh, what are some things here that we're going to, there's some practical, practical things when it comes to these false teachers. It says, first, they rely on their dreams. They rely on dreams. Here's one of the signs, right? They may not be ex 
uh, overtly saying, do whatever you want. They may not be saying, hey, I don't re uh, submit to God's authority. But one of the telltale signs is they're going to be relying on dreams. You know, this is very subtle, but it is very prevalent. These teachers who would uh, actually elevate their dreams uh, on the same level as God's word or even above in some cases, that is a sign that, man, we may be dealing with a false teacher here. Um, there is a, I'll mention it. There is a children's pastor from the Bethel Church, if you're familiar with Bethel Church. And this pastor, this children's pastor was sharing recently that, I don't know if it was recent, it might have been a time ago, but that a pastor hurt him in his past, that he was hurt by a pastor. And he said he had this dream where Jesus came to him and he asked for forgiveness. He said, I know you've been hurt by this pastor. I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me, Jesus. Um, what? Excuse me. Jesus does not ask for forgiveness, does he? That's not, uh, what on earth are you talking about? And this was a whole message that he gave. Psalm 1830, what does it say? God's way is perfect. God's way is perfect. If God's way is perfect, do you think that he's going to come groveling to us, asking for forgiveness? Man, I really, I really took you into something. I just screwed up. I'm sorry about that. Will you forgive me? No. God doesn't ask us for forgiveness. God's way is perfect. If this pastor did experience something at the hand of another pastor, um, God it allowed it in his life for his good, right? It doesn't mean that the thing itself was good. But Romans uh, 8, 28, and 29 says that he allows all things for our good to conform us to the image of Christ. Paraphrasing, right? Um, no. Relying on dreams here to go on this whole thing that he was trying to teach on. There are a lot of people who rely on their dreams. Um, I've even talked to believers who can tell me about 85 dreams that they've had that God was teaching them something, and yet I have yet to hear one thing that they've learned from God's word itself, right? Okay, that is a problem, relying on dreams. Can God speak to us? Yes, he can. But are we relying on that? Are we elevating that to the same level as God's word? I hope not, because that is a problem. Defile the flesh. Second, what do these, what do these false teachers do? What is a telltale sign? Defile the flesh. Not going to spend a ton of time here, but uh, the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, it says that every sin that a person can commit is outside the body except for one. Sexual immorality is a, is a sin that we do to our bodies. So I think that's what it's talking about here, sexual immorality, when it says defile the flesh. We're actually um, defiling our bodies here. I think it's a sexual sin that Jude is referring to. And uh, unfortunately, this is also prevalent in the church. 40% of pastors, this is a 2007 study that I found, 40% uh, of pastors wind up having an affair. 40% of pastors. Um, wow, it is extremely prevalent that you are going to have someone who would claim to be a Christian leader, a teacher, and who is going to stumble in this area of sexual sin. And so, once again, a, a sign, a, a sign. It's not necessarily, oh, they're definitely a false teacher. There are genuine teachers who can slip and fall, right? There are uh, genuine teachers of the word who can sin, absolutely. Uh, but it is a sign. You're going to see this very prevalent with false teachers compared to true teachers of the word. Um, and... Never mind, I won't mention that name. It's out there. <laughs> just do a little bit of Googling. Abuse in the church, just Google that. All right, what's another sign? Third, reject authority. And that's what we're talking about here uh, very much so. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how many Christian leaders would see themselves as the ultimate authority, right? They're rejecting other authorities because, hey, I am the ultimate authority, <laughs> Um, I don't need any accountability in my life. I don't need anyone to um, be a, um, what, yeah, accountability in my life. I don't need anyone 
uh, to tell me what to do. I don't need to obey any of the scriptures that says to regard um, my brother as more significant than myself. I don't have to do that because I am the most significant. I don't have to do these different things. Uh, I am the ultimate authority here. I reject all of the authority. That is very, very common among uh, Christian leaders, unfortunately. They see themselves as uh, just infallible, right? They just know everything. And I don't need another authority in my life. Uh, these kind of people will always find willing subjects. <laughs> there are some people who are just ready to follow somebody, somebody who's super strong and knows everything, and I'm just willing to get un in line with this person. Uh, yeah, they reject authority. Unfortunately, they can always find a victim. And what is another sign? So what do we have here? We have signs here. We have relying on dreams. They are falling into sexual sin. They're rejecting authority. These are signs of a false teachers. And uh, the third one, or the fourth one here is they blaspheme the glorious ones. And we have a, biz a bizarre story to explain what he means by this. A very bizarre story. Blasphemes the glorious ones, the glorious ones referring to angels. And uh, I think what, really what we're talking about here is just arrogance. Just an absolute arrogance. Uh, Jude is going to give an, a story here as an illustration I'll read it again. When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. I would love to tell you to turn in your Bibles to that story like we did the other stories, but it is not in your Bibles. You will not find this story in the Bible. Where on earth does this story come from? Uh, this comes from a According to early church fathers, they say this comes from a book called The Assumption of Moses, or sometimes it's called The Testament of Moses. Now, what some of you just heard was that there are other books out there that you need to go find and study and dedicate a lot of energy towards. That's not what I just said, okay? The Assumption of Moses is not the Word of God. How do I know this? We only have one copy of The Assumption of Moses. We found it in the 1800s, and it's incomplete. It was written on a piece of leather. They scraped it off, wrote something else over it, and in the 1800s, they were like, wait a minute, there's something underneath here. What did they scrape off here? And it's part of this book, The Assumption of Moses. We don't have the whole book. And we don't have this story. In the cop one copy that we have, we don't have this story because this comes in the end of the story. It would seem we don't have the end of the book. Okay, so God's word endures forever. This book has not endured forever. Therefore, it is not God's word, Right? God's word endures forever. If it did not endure forever, it cannot be God's word. Assumption of Moses is not God's word. It might contain some truths, but it is not truth in the same way that God's word is. Now, this story must be true, though, because Jude is quoting it. It made it into the Bible. God inspired it. So this story is true. What is going on here? What would have happened if Satan got the, the body? Why did he want the body? Um, th those are all the rabbit holes that you could go down and look into the things that this book is not saying. Okay, let's focus on what it is saying. It's saying here that Michael did not blaspheme Satan. What does this mean? It, uh, blasphemy is like this arrogant irreverence, like I'm better than you, uh, you're beneath me, I'm going to disrespect you. That's, that's the idea of blasphemy in the broad sense. And these teachers, it says that they blaspheme the glorious ones. You think about an angel, more powerful, more beautiful, uh, very much elevated, and Peter brings this out a little bit more explicitly. Um, if anyone should have a little bit of humility towards an angel, it would be a human, right? Or made a little bit lower than the angels. Now, if anyone is going to be able to be blasphemous, why not Michael towards a fallen angel, right? If anyone's above Satan, it's got to be Michael, right? And he's saying, look, I'm not even blaspheming you. I'm not rebuking you. The Lord rebuke you, is the story here. So, Michael does not have this arrogant blasphemy towards a glorious one. If he did not, how much more should we not? But the, I think the point here, the broader point here, is that uh, false teachers are overly arrogant. Overly arrogant. Uh, man, I'm just the best. I don't have to, I can just blaspheme anything I don't understand. You see that so often as well, this arrogance. Um, Verse 10, and we'll finish up here. It says, these people are uh, 
They blaspheme all they do not understand, right? You don't know, even know what you're talking about, and you're t- being disrespectful, arrogant, irreverent. And they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand inst- instinctively. And here's a little illustration I'll give here. Uh, how many of you have ever been fishing and caught the same fish twice? <laughs> you catch this little dinky fish, and you're like, dude, it's like, you know, this big. You take it off the hook, you throw it in, you throw it back in the hook, and you catch that exact same fish with the next cast. It's like you just escaped the claws of death. And you just bit this exact same hook again. What is wrong with you? Uh, Did you not learn the first time? No, they don't learn. It's a fish. All that the fish knows is I'm hungry. There is food. Instinct, bite it. Swallow the food. That is all the fish knows. In the same way, someone who is arrogant, irreverent, blasphemous, they are just reacting. They're shooting first, thinking later. They are just acting on instincts. I don't need, I just know the right thing to do here. I don't need to pray about it. I don't need to think about it. I don't need to get any counsel. I'm just good to go. I got the answer. It's this. They, they don't even have time. Like they move so fast that not even God uh, has time to get a word in, right? I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. They are already moving forward. They have not spent any time listening to what God might have to say. I think that's the arrogant irreverence that... Uh, it's talking about here, just acting on instinct. Yeah. And so often they say, well, God, God told me to do this. Uh, there's this guy, he's, he's a Colorado pastor. He's being prosecuted right now. Why is he being prosecuted? Because he had a scam going. He had a cryptocurrency. He created a cryptocurrency. He raised $3 million, and it was a scam. I mean, you look at the definition of a scam, and you look what he did. It's a scam. 100%. Raised $3 million. Over $1 million he kept for himself to improve his home, to take lavish vacations, all this kinds of stuff. And his, and his honest-to-goodness excuse to this day, he's facing prosecution, is God told me to do this. I just stepped out in faith. I just, stepped, I just took God at his word. He said, create this cryptocurrency and to do these things for my house. And so I just, what was I to do? I had to be obedient. I had to move forward and uh, take God at his word. Uh, No, sorry, Uh, this is actually a problem, this blaming it on God, Uh, just acting and doing whatever you want and then blaming it on God that God told me to do this. God would not tell you to do a scam. I'm 100% sure. Um, False teeth, that's a sign of that perhaps this guy is not uh, a true teacher of the word of God. All right, so let's, let's just summarize. Like I said, a lot of the application is going to be a little bit more weighted next week. Um, but the summary of what we talked about today is that we have a pure gospel message that we've been given. We're contending, right, for the faith that was once delivered, or once for all delivered to the saints. We have a pure gospel message that we've been given. We've been given uh, so much in our relationship with Christ. And there are false teachers that are close in proximity Maybe even worse today than before, they're in your home, okay? They're in your home, unless you're living in the Stone Age. If you have the internet, they're in your home. They're close by, and they are hard to recognize. They're very hard to recognize. And so if we fall under their teaching, if we start listening to their teaching, they will lead us off track. They're already under condemnation, right? Uh, that's That's what the passage says here. And the Application is that we must contend. This is both individual and as a group. I think we have to contend as individuals. What are we going to listen to? What are we going to accept as a as a as a Bible teacher? What am I going to fill my mind with? Um, That's an individual choice. It's also a choice as a group as well. Are we going to contend for the faith and be on the lookout and stay away from people who would actually say, you know what, I can do whatever I want and I can reject God's authority. That's where it leads. It might not look like that on the outside, but that is what the heart of it is when you finally get down to what is driving this from the inside, where the heart motivations. So we must contend. We've got to be on the lookout, and we've got to stay away. And I think that the reason God gives us this, and maybe the reason he gives it to us twice in Second Peter 2 as well, is the fact that this is really crucial, and you will not be looking for it if you don't know what to look for. Kind of like cancer screenings, right? 
If we did not believe in cancer, if we didn't know cancer was a thing, would we go and get regular screenings when they tell us to go get them? No, we wouldn't. We wouldn't go do that at all. But the cancer could still be there, right? Do we do the screenings on a regular basis because we recognize, hey, this can pop up. And when we believe that that's true, we go and we actually do the procedures, right? Go get tested. I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to get tested at some point, but I'm getting older. Um, but the, uh, the charge here for the church is that, yeah, you've got to be on the lookout for this. And we would not be on the lookout naturally. But like I said, uh, more of the application next week. Thank you for hanging with me. This is a lot to get through. We went a little long. Um, yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this book of Jude. Uh, Father, there is so much here. So we pray a, a, a few things in regards to that. Um, one, that you help us remember what it is that we've looked at this morning. Two, that you would help us to really understand why it is that you're sharing the things that you're sharing and not get sidetracked by what you're not saying in these, in these verses. Um, and three, Lord, I think that I really want to just pray that you would show us how to apply it in our lives. So, Father, we're praying that you help it stay with us. Father, we're praying that you show us the, the right uh, things that you want us to see, but, Father, then also how, how we can actually um, make it something that it, we're, we're practicing in our lives, Father. Uh, we, we pray, as we're going to see in, uh, next week, Father, we pray for the people who have been um, and are being led off track by people who um, are, are, not, are not your kids and are claiming the spiritual authority. Um, we would pray that you would give us an awareness of those around us who are being uh, taken down the, the path, the, the dangerous teachings of false teachers, Father, and in love uh, be able to help get them back on their uh, track with you in a right relationship with you, Father, um, because that's ultimately what it boils down to is the fact that uh, we know you, we have you in our lives, and, um, and we get to experience you on a daily basis as we are understanding you properly, as we're understanding your word correctly, as we're falling in line with uh, your authority, Father. Uh, submission to you is not subjugation, it's freedom, which is what your word teaches. Uh, you have set us free to follow you in service, and that's really how we were made, and that's why it's freedom, so... Uh, we thank you for that. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>